Hi, this is Ms. Delosier, and these are your notes on enzymes. So the first thing we need to talk about is what is an enzyme. An enzyme is a biological catalyst, um, which if you don't know what a catalyst is, a catalyst is just something that speeds up the rate of a chemical reaction. Um, it's not actually a reactant in the reaction. It's just um, kind of a helper in the reaction. It's going to decrease the amount of energy required for the reaction to proceed. Um, and so it's not going to be consumed or chemically altered permanently in the reaction. Um, and it specifically lowers what we call the activation energy of a reaction. And we're going to talk about that a little later when we look at a graph of energy and enzymes. Um, you do need to know that it lowers the activation energy of a reaction, but I don't want you freaking out about that right now. Um, basically, the, the activation energy is just the total amount of energy needed for the chemical reaction to occur. Um, and the most important thing you need to know about enzymes is enzymes are proteins. Um, so if you remember from our discussion on proteins, proteins, structure of the protein, dictates the function of the protein. And that is absolutely true in enzymes. Um, the structure is entirely responsible for its function. So Enzymes can either build larger molecules, so if I take two and put them together through dehydration synthesis, the enzyme could actually speed up the rate of that synthesis, and we call that an anabolic reaction, like anabolic steroids make you bigger, they make you swole. Um, in an anabolic reaction, um, that is going to be a reaction that is going to form larger molecules. Um, and then the opposite of that, uh, opposite of building anabolic, is going to be breaking down large molecules, so I'm going to go ahead and do the opposite, and I'm going to break down into two monomers there, and that would be a catabolic reaction. Um, so catabolic breaks down, um, and so that's the basics of enzymes. So let's look a little bit specifically at what's happening um, in my big generalized favorite um, enzyme drawing, Pac-Man, of course. So I'm going to draw my enzyme, Pac-Man, and then I'm going to um, point out that Pac-Man's mouth is the active site of the enzyme. The active site is the business end of the enzyme. It's where all the action is going to actually happen. Um, so it's where the chemical reaction is going to occur on the substrate. And it's got a very specific shape. Again, protein's structure dictates its function. So I have my active site, and then I'm going to have my substrate, pizza, blue pizza in this case. And so I'm going to have my active site and my substrate, and then what's going to happen is they're going to join together. So they're going to bind together, and that's going to form um, an enzyme substrate complex. Super original naming here, huh? Once my enzyme substrate complex forms, the chemical reaction is going to proceed. And in this case, I'm going to have a catabolic reaction where I break my pizza down into two pieces. So I'm going to break it down. So I'm going to have my enzyme plus my products. Um, just as a aside, the substrate is a reactant. At the end, I have the products. That's basic chemistry, but you, you do need to be familiar with that. So I'm going to have my products at the end. So I take my enzyme, I bind it to the substrate, I end up with products. And if you notice, the enzyme is exactly the same as it was before. I know because I cut and paste it. All right, so that's the basics of an enzyme reaction. Um, you're going to think of it like a lock and a key. Um, in your head, that's going to make it easier for you to think about. In this case, the enzyme would be the lock, the substrate would be the key. If the substrate's the wrong shape, it's not going to fit in the lock, right? Uh, that's not really what's happening. Um, that's an oversimplification, but that's going to make it way easier for you to understand conceptually. What's really happening, we think, the, the current model is called the induced fit model. And the induced fit model basically says that the active site doesn't actually lock into its final shape until the substrate is completely bound um, to the active site. And then once that happens, you're going to actually get um, the reaction being catalyzed. Sorry, I don't know why I wrote active twice there. My bad. Um, so once the active site actually locks into place, once it's bound to the substrate, you're going to get the reaction catalyzed. So if I modify my picture, there's my enzyme, there's my substrate, they're going to bind together, they get locked into place, and then my enzymes actually, the active site's going to change a little bit. So in this case, Pac-Man grows teeth. 
there, there we go. So that's that would be my induced fit model, right? Um, but it's basically you're going to get the exact same reaction, so you'd end up with the same products at the end. So that's the basics of what's happening. Now there's all sorts of advanced models of enzymes, um, like there's uh, competitive inhibition and non-competitive inhibition, and we're going to talk about all of those in class. Um, I don't, I don't want to put those in this video. We we might do a second video on those, but basically. Competitive inhibition is exactly what it sounds like. In competitive inhibition, the substrate and the competitor are competing for the same spot, the active site. In non-competitive, they're not competing for the active site. So um, those are pretty simple to understand, and we're going to do a little activity with those in class. Uh, after that, we're going to talk about this enzyme-catalyzed reactions and energy. So this is the graph, right? This is a big enzyme graph for the rest of the, the video. So in an enzymes, when we talk about free energy and the reaction, um, this gets a little confusing, but you, you basically just need to, to understand this graph. And you don't really have to understand the calculation of how you get the free energy, just understand the graph. So what's going to happen is I'm going to have my reactants, right? And my reactants have a certain amount of free energy available. You don't need to know what that means. You just need to know that they have a certain amount of free energy available at that point. So the, it's kind of the amount of energy to get to the reactant stage. Then, to get them to the, the product stage, there's a different free energy, right? Now, to get from reactants to products, you have to go up a hill, which means you have to put a certain amount of energy in to get to that point. So, I can't just paste them together without any input of energy because work always is going to require energy, so that reaction is going to require some energy. So the reactants there are going to have to go through what we call a transitional state. Um, and that's basically going to be when they're in the enzyme substrate complex in enzyme catalyzed reactions, which this is not. So they're going to go to that transition state where they're beginning to actually bind in this example, but they're not bound yet. So that transition state is like going uphill, right? So obviously to get uphill, you got to use more energy. Um, so that hill, the height of the hill, is referred to as the activation energy. Um, and that's the activation energy for no enzyme in this particular example that I drew. So the higher the hill, the more activation energy, the harder it is, right? So if that's with no enzyme present, then if I put an enzyme in which catalyzes a reaction and it lowers the activation energy and it makes everything easier and faster, then the hill's just smaller. So I want to draw a smaller hill. So that would be my activation energy AE with an enzyme present, just a smaller hill, okay? So um, the last thing that we need to label on there is actually delta G, um, which is basically the net free energy. I know that that does not intuitively look like the net free energy. It looks like the net free energy. You should have to do a subtraction. Trust me, delta G is the net free energy. That's just what we refer to it as. It's actually the Gibbs free energy and basically what it is is it's the energy difference between the reactants here and the products here right and so in this particular case the reactants energy is higher than the products energy which means that delta G in this case is negative um, which means that that extra energy once I went from reactants to products that delta G is negative so that energy is going to be released so this is what we call um, you're going to think of it as an exothermic reaction because that's easier for you. It's really exergonic because it doesn't have to heat up, right? Same thing, it just doesn't have to be heat. So it's an exergonic reaction. It's, an, it's a reaction that releases energy. Um, and when delta G is negative, this happens spontaneously. Um, when delta G is positive, um, when delta G is positive, then the reaction is endergonic and it's going to require energy and what that would look like is instead of the products being here and the reactants being here the products would be here and the reactants would be like up here so you'd be like like that but you would have the the products at a higher activation or a higher um, free energy state at the end of the reaction um, and generally when we're talking about enzyme reactions we don't have that because the whole point is to actually speed up and make the reaction easier and so what would be the point of that there are some none for this unit though um, so that's it for um, the, uh, the energy diagram. 
Uh, just as a quick notes from your enzyme lab, because you are not doing all of the different um, possibilities for the enzyme lab, these are the four possibilities that we have people in class doing, so these are the four that you're responsible for knowing. What happens if I increase the substrate concentration? So there's my basic graph, right? As time goes on, um, my enzyme rate is going to slow down and eventually level off because I run out of, I run out of substrate. Um, so if I increase the amount of substrate, what's going to happen is initially I'm going to get a higher slope. I'm going to get a higher reaction rate because there's going to be more collisions because there's more substrate. But I'll also end up, if I have more substrate at the beginning, then I can have more product at the end. So I'm going to get a higher rate and a higher leveling off point. So that's what happens if you increase substrate. Decrease substrate, you do the opposite. Um, if you increase the enzyme concentration, if I increase the enzyme concentration, my leveling off is going to be the same because like in our example with the peroxide, what happens is I, I run out of peroxide, I run out of peroxide, I can't ever make any more products. So when you increase enzyme concentration, what happens is you increase the rate, that slope is going to be higher, but the leveling off point is going to be exactly the same. Um, so you can't produce any extra product because you haven't put in any extra substrate. In my temperature reaction, as I increase temperature, what's going to happen is you're going to get this curve. You're going to get a constantly increasing rate, and then eventually it's just going to go roll and plummet. And that's because as the reaction rate increases, the, the hotter it is, the more the molecules are moving around, kinetic molecular theorem, right? So as the molecules move around, they're going to collide, increase heat, increase kinetic energy, increase collisions, blah, 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 more collisions, more enzymatic activity, more enzymes breaking down substrates to products, uh, except eventually you're going to heat it up so much that the proteins will actually denature, so then the enzyme stops functioning entirely, so then it's going to plummet off. So you're going to have a very steep slope going up, and then eventually you're going to reach the denaturation point, and it plummets. Um, there's no set denaturing point for all enzymes, because it kind of depends on where the enzymes are found in nature. Enzymes that are found in humans versus enzymes that are found in bacteria that live in hot springs, they're going to have a different point of denaturing. And then the last one that you guys are doing is uh, pH. So with pH, it looks kind of similar to temperature, except the curves are a little more uniform. What happens is every enzyme has an optimum pH. So it's got a peak where it works the best. So enzymes that are in my stomach are going to have more acidic optimums than enzymes that are in my small intestine because the small intestine actually contains some, um, some fairly alkaline, some fairly basic enzymes. So if I have a different enzyme, it's probably going to have a different optimum pH. So I hope that helps. If you have any questions, come on in and see me before the test um, or send me an email.